Thank you for watching, everyone. Even our replay viewers, we're getting our streams going and we're giving everyone a chance or a moment to join us. So we'll start the show soon. I'm going to get my stream going. And Delane Adams is joining me here. Delane, you were about to tell us some latest news because there's a lot going on with action alerts. And whenever we have action alerts, what do we want people to do? Take action. want people to call in and uh, make sure their voices are heard and make sure we can get our members of Congress to act. And we'll definitely let people know uh, what action that we need taken. Because they pay attention to phone calls, Definitely don't pay they? attention to phone calls. Um, also, they'll pay attention to any emails that are sent from your account. We want, make, we want to make sure that um, federal contract workers are, are compensated um, for missing their paychecks during that government shutdown. One or two so. paychecks, I mean, that's just crazy. A lot of people don't have savings beyond. Yeah, 35 days, um, longest shut, government shutdown in history. And then, again, we're, we're talking about many people won't get paid again for another two weeks. So. Right. And so. then the contractors, some of them aren't listed to get paid oh, at yeah. all because they're contractors. And that's, that's where the concentration is now to make sure that federal contract workers are compensated. Um, through bipartisan legislation presented by um, Congressman Norcross. So it's bipartisan. It's called Fairness for Federal Contractors Act of 2019, um, along with uh, Congressman Chris Smith, Republican out of New Jersey. So again, this is a, this is a bipartisan issue. We want to make sure that federal contra contract workers are compensated for uh, back pay, back pay that they missed during the longest government shutdown in history. Um, workers that include members um, at District 166 at a local 2061, uh, they're at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, like workers at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and Alabama, so many others. Um, so thousands of members, thousands of IM members that are affected by this. We want to make sure that uh, they're compensated. It's no fault of their own. I mean, they still have mortgages. They still have health care premiums, daycare, and so many other things. So okay. we're asking people to call 1-888-894-1028 to take action. Um, you see the action alert right there. Thanks, Joe, for putting that up. Okay. Again, 1-888-894-1028, and uh, ask your member of Congress to co-sponsor the Fairness for Federal Contractors Act of 2019. All right, it's 3 o'clock. All right. Activate Live starts now. Activate your voice. Fight for your rights. Speak up. Speak up. We're union and we're proud. Go union. Live from Maryland, this is Activate Live. Welcome to Activate Live, where union members activate their voices on behalf of all working people. I'm Tanya Hutchins, joining you from our Robert J. Kalaski studio at our headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Here's Delane Adams with the latest IAM News. Well, the biggest news of the, of the day is uh, we're coming off the longest government shutdown in history, 35 days. And now we're bringing um, bipartisan legislation called the Fairness for Federal Contractors Act of 2019 that was introduced by Congressman Norcross out of New Jersey and also co-sponsored by Republican Chris Smith out of New Jersey. Again, bipartisan uh, legislation that will provide our federal contract workers back pay. Um, again, no fault of their own. They did not receive pay for, um, for the majority of that time. And so now we need to make sure they're compensated. And this bill, the Fairness for Federal Contractors Act of 2019, would help achieve that goal. So we're asking people to take action. Uh, thank you, Joe. Joe just put the action alert up, 1-888-894-1028. And you will be connected with members of Congress, your member of Congress, um, in order to let them know that um, you want them to co-sponsor the Fairness for Fed Federal Contractors Act of 2019. So again, it's an important issue. Um, there's a lot of stories that have been told by our members, a lot of, uh, a lot of stories of, of sorrow, and so we just want to make sure that, um, 
that their member, our members are compensated, along with other federal contract workers that, that will fall under this bill. It's the right thing to do. If you get work, you should be paid for it. Yeah, I mean, still, the student loans didn't go away. Uh, the mortgage payments didn't go away. Health care premiums, daycare, car tuition, payments, car yeah. payments. So, so many other financial obligations that were still present during this, uh, during this needless government shutdown. So we're asking our members again, Please call members, family members, whoever. If you're watching this, call 1-888-894-1028, and please take action. Okay, we'll get everybody on that, and we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more information um, in the comments. We can actually put that information yes. in there as well. Yeah, and please show solidarity in the comments. Um, get your family members to, to please, please take action and call. Um, this includes members at uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, Johnson Space Center, and, and Huntsville, so many other affected members throughout, uh, throughout the territories. And there have been rallies all over the place in Washington, D.C., yes. and out in the district, so. Yeah, and, um, and of course, our federal employees, members of NEFI IM, um, and others of the Machinist Union, they will get back pay, uh, but right now we're really concentrating on the federal contract workers that will not get back pay. Okay. So. Now, there are some other bills that are being introduced today, aren't there? Yes, yes. So one, one very important bill, uh, a lot of work has been, uh, has been put into this, and this is the Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, it was introduced today. Um, there's a social media storm that we participate in along mm -hmm. with other groups like Clue. Um, that's so. a coalition of labor union women, so that's one of the groups that um, took part. And so you see the equal pay hashtag, paycheck fairness. Um, I mean, as many of us know in the labor movement, labor unions, um, equal pay is just a part of us. You know, that's just what we do. But for others, so many others out there, they don't have that same luxury of having equal pay for doing the same type of work. So, um, so I, we really want to thank all the groups who, um, who are leading this effort. And uh, hopefully we can make sure that this Paycheck Fairness Act uh, will, will will pass and, and do well. Okay, and we have some anniversaries. I know this week, yesterday, was an anniversary of, yeah. Yeah, you see um, this week in history, Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was signed into law 10 years ago. Uh, you see a lot of our champions up there, people who have uh, been fighting for working men and women their whole lives. And so, um, you know, it's, it's 10 years and still we need to make sure that uh, we continue to make sure that everybody gets fair pay. Um, and there's there's Lily Ledbetter, Ledbetter herself. Um, just read a quote from her. She says, giving women my Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act without the Paycheck Fairness Act is like giving them a nail without the hammer. So hopefully um, this legislation, the Paycheck Fairness Act, will be that hammer that uh, makes everybody whole. And today is a big anniversary in Canada as well. It is. So the right to strike was affirmed in Canada um, on January 30th, 2015. Canada Supreme Court affirmed the right to strike, stating that the Public Service Essential Services Act violated freedom of, associ of association. So this photo coming up after this shows the Winnipeg general strike from 1919. And uh, that's so significant because the IAM played a huge role in that uh, general strike in 1919. And so. I hear this is like an iconic photo with that bus overturned, um, and here you could see the magnitude of that strike. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe this was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, I mean, and, and look at us now. I mean, we're still uh, still fighting a lot of the same issues, so so it's, uh, it's important. We have to take action, so, and it's important to have act, activate live to make sure that everybody out there knows uh, knows that we're still fighting. That's right. We still need to activate our voices. Activate our voices. Okay. So. Thank you so much, Delane. Thank you, Tanya. Did I cut you off? Did you get everything? No, I think okay. we're good. All right. Hey, call call that action line again. That's right. So that's where we're at. So. All right. Thanks All right. so much. Thanks, Tanya. Have a great show. Thanks. Well, when a tragedy happens, very few people are prepared. And there's the phone number for the action alert that um, Delane was just talking about, 888-894-1028. That's 888-894-1028 call Congress about this bipartisan legislation.
Well, as I was saying, when a tragedy happens, very few people are prepared, whether it occurs on the job or off. Workers often need help to cope with the situation. No matter where you work, there may be help available. The IAM's Transportation Territory has developed a critical incidents response team from all three of its districts. It's called CERT for short. And we have several people here today to explain in detail how the program works. We start with District 142 Employee Assistance Program Director, Paul Schultz. Thank you so much for being here, Paul. Well, thank you for having us, Tanya. No problem. So first of all, tell us what is a critical incident? A critical incident is a traumatic event that evokes a very powerful response amongst the people that are involved in it. <clears throat> and it often overwhelms their ability to cope. They, we all have coping mechanisms that we use every day in our normal lives for things that go on, but they'll have a traumatic incident that will be of such a large nature, such a large scope, that it will overwhelm or temporarily overwhelm their coping skills. And so that's when we come in and try to help out. Okay, so what is CERT? How, how does the CERT team help? Okay, the critical CERT is Critical Incident Response Team and is where the CERT team was developed is the Transportation Department through its three districts had had employee assistance programs for a long time and we took members from the employee assistance program and developed our CERT team and a little bit of history on it is we responded uh, to the, there was a shooting at a Pulse nightclub in Orlando and quite a few Southwest Airlines and United Airlines members were affected and the airlines called up to the leadership of the transportation department and asked us if we could help out, if we could send people down. So the EAP, EAP people from District 141, 142 went down to Orlando and we spent a week working with our members down there trying to help them through this. At the end of the week, uh, Joe Tiberi with the Transportation Department uh, got us all together in a conference room and he said, we're going to do this, we're going to do this correctly, we're going to do it right, we're going to train you, you're going to have the best training possible, and we're going to put together a team to do this and take care of our members whenever these tragedies happen, and that's how it was developed. That is like not only crisis, um, dealing with a crisis, but it's also crisis communications because you guys got together right away. How much of a difference did that make? It made a huge difference in that right from the beginning we decided we were going to get the, the most informed people in the field. Uh, we got... Um, the founders of Critical Incident Response to come and do our trainings. We, we found uh, the, trans, the leadership of the Transportation Department under the guidance of Joe Tiberi and Sandra Gardner. Uh, they, they, and Brian Hutchinson was, uh, Brian Hutchins was, uh, and he's here, by the yeah. way. So he's he was gonna... instrumental in getting the best folks available to teach us. We had the top people. Uh, one of them was Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell, who's a pioneer in this field. And they came in and they taught the initial class. And we have a recurrent class once a year. We communicate with each other throughout the year and we constantly talk and work about how work on how we can get things done better and part of our training is when the when the authorities the experts and in critical incident are done the very last day of our training we call it our IAM day where we take all the information we've learned and we say, okay, how do we adapt this to our situation and help our members most effectively? 
This is a great benefit of the union. I mean, this helps so many people. Um, tell us a little bit about how CERT helped at Letterkenny. Uh, Letterkenny was, for people that may not know, it's an army depot and they had an explosion in, um, in the paint department and there was uh, three people very critically injured. One member died, I believe, at the hospital that day and uh, about three weeks after, I think, tragically, another member also passed from it. And there's a third still recovering. But they were completely overwhelmed because like there was, there was one of the members that was right there when the explosion happened and he was trying to use a fire, extingu a fire extinguisher to put out the uh, fire, but they were just emotionally overwhelmed. And so we come in and part of what we do is we let them know that there's really nothing wrong with them. They are normal people. It's the world around them that's, an abnorm that's abnormal. They're a normal person going through an abnormal situation. And we just try to bring out the coping skills that they have in them and help them to get through it. And one of the ways we've found that works very well in doing this is to try and do peer on peer so that as a, like say as a mechanic, if you've just been in this overwhelming situation, it's nice if we can bring in a mechanic to talk to you and they're familiar with your job, they're familiar with what you do, your work environment, and just help you to talk through it and use the coping skills that you probably already have and help you with some coping skills that maybe you don't uh, get through it. Well, it definitely makes a difference. We already have some comments, and we have one from Scott Geyer, I see. Um, and Scott is saying EAP helps. He goes, that comes from all of us at Letterkenny. So that is a verification right there of the support and how important it is um, from Letterkenny. Um, so people are, are really affected by this, and, and we thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you'd like to mention before you leave? Uh, I would love just complete, th and thank you, Scott. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet the folks at Letterkenny. Just absolutely wonderful people. They treated us great while we were there. And I would just like to do a shout out to the leadership of the, trans of the IAM Transportation Department. They are uh, Cito Pantoya, uh, Joe Tiberi, Sandra Gardner, and I know I'm leaving out others, but they are totally supportive. They help us in every way. And I still remember what Joe Tiberi told us. He said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right, and we're gonna take care of our membership and to me, that's what it's all about. It is. I mean, we have to help our members. That's why we're here. So thank you so much for joining us, Paul. We appreciate it. So if you have any questions about the Critical Incident Response Team or CERT, feel free to ask them in the comments section. We have four people here in our studio. Sorry, Instagram, we're still here. That's OK. <laughs> and um, we have four people in our studio right now, including um, District 141 Member Assistance Services Director Brian Hutchinson, who just sat down. Here's one, um, one comment already saying hello from I am Delta. That's Juliana Helminski. I hope I pronounced it right. Is it Juliana? All right. So thanks for writing in, Juliana. Great. Um, even people on Instagram are writing in. Dave Lehive is saying, greetings from Local Lodge 1932. Today, as shop stewards are going through training with the help from IM District 141 educators. Um, so thank you, Dave, for writing in as well. And we have people, Greg Thompson from District 166, Local Lodge 57 um, is on there as well. IM District 4 has given us a shout out from Local Lodge 186. And people on Instagram, Millie Maybach has um, given us a thumbs up about EAP also. Um, so thank you on Instagram as well. So we really appreciate um, all of that. So we have Brian Hutchinson sitting here. Come on in, scoot in, how are you? Um, so we would love for you to explain to us 
how the CERT program actually works. What are the steps that are taken? If you could take us through sure. some of those steps. Sure, absolutely. So an incident happens, as Paul was describing, like Letterkenny or uh, Pulse nightclub or the Fort Lauderdale uh, shootings. Um, and the initial response is to send somebody in to do an assessment. Let's send in a couple people, get a good idea of what's going on and how did that happen? What do we need to do to respond? So we send in some folks um, and then they do a triage basically. And then we'll determine what do we need. Uh, for Fort Lauderdale, we needed a, a big team. For a hur the hurricane in Houston, we needed everybody. That was a huge effort. So like you said, you needed a big team at first. Correct. How many people is that usually? So it's anywhere from eight to 12 people initially. And if we need more, we'll start pulling in more of our EAP folks. Um, and, and so we get a good idea of what's going on. And then we use what's called psychological first aid, which is we have to stabilize everybody. When an incident happened, people go into shock and they don't necessarily function like they normally did. As Paul was saying, when you have a critical incident, your body kind of shuts down and goes into you know, survival mode. Um, we need to recognize that. We need to make sure they're safe. Do they have housing? Do they have food? Do they have support around them? Uh, we'll make sure all that's happening initially. Once that's happened, then we start the critical incidents uh, uh, diffusing process which is just sitting down, talking with people in a group that had perhaps witnessed the, an incident or have been part of it. They all talk about, this is what we saw, this is what happened. It's just an easy process to talk through. There's Nobody has to talk if they don't want to, um, but we diffuse it and get them to just talk about what they saw. That helps everybody kind of commonize the, the experience. And at that point, then they can hopefully return to normalcy the next step after that is, once they've been diffused, um, then we start getting everybody back in and we start doing what's called a debriefing. What happened? What did you see? How are you doing? Where are you at? Are you okay? And we get eyes on everybody and we start to address the people that maybe are not coping as well with it as some of the others. Um, and then we follow up with them and get them the proper services. We don't do counseling, we don't do psychotherapy, but it's just a, a good idea. It's a good way of getting everybody to kind of see, here's where I'm at, I need help, I don't need help, I'm good. And it's I'm supportive, it sounds like it's, it's supportive. Correct, yep. That's one thing about the Machinist Union, we are a great union and support our members. Um, and as Paul was just saying, the, the leadership here is very tuned into that. Um, Bob Martinez, Cito Pantoya, Joe Tiberi, Sandy Gardner, she's, she's a godsend for us. It's all about what do the members need and how do we respond to that? And that's why this all happened was to be able to respond to the members and address whatever needs they have. Now, how do our members become part of this team? I mean, how, what a kind of training is involved? Yeah, so these are all folks that come from the EAP side of things. They've already gone through, most of them, the four classes in Whip and Singer. That's the way to start out with this, really, if you're interested in it. The CISD team, the, the critical incidents team, is really all about um, those folks that have some basic skills, then this is a, a different level. So you want to start off with the EAP classes, go through those, then uh, you can become a member of the CISD team. Um, but you really need some specialized training to do this because this, this is a process that has to be pretty, it's critical. Now that video I think was from a hazmat class where right. the CERT team took part right. in that class to kind of help right. with the response after there was a, a mock plane crash. Right. It's part of our training is, is doing a lot of role playing where you can go in and you can make a mistake because we don't want you making a mistake in a real critical incident um, where it can affect it. And we've had two classes. I think this is one right. of the photos right. from one of the classes. Yep. Um, but did it start in 2017 and then there was another class in 2018? Correct. So, so the International Critical Incidents and Stress Foundation, the ICICF that Paul was referring to, um, Paul Mitchell and George Everly are the founders of that. They started this with first responders um, here in the Maryland area, actually. Um, they come down and do the training for us uh, and we do individual training and group training and then now this year we're into the advanced individual training that the critical incidents team will be able to do. That is great. Yeah, it's how, good stuff. How much of a difference does this make um, if you want to talk about any, any CERT incidents that you were involved with? Sure. Um, 
What comes to mind is we had a shooting in Houston um, maybe three or four years ago where a gentleman walked in and had a gun in the lobby where all the customer service agents were there to witness this, and he started shooting into the air, which then got the attention of a lot of different authorities, and they, find, they ended up shooting him uh, in the lobby, which affected everyone that saw that this was a huge scene. How it, how it helps is we know if we get in to talk to everybody, lay eyes on them, and say, how are you doing, that that then prevents something like PTSD developing down the line which you don't really know is developing until maybe a month or so later, sometimes longer. We know if we get in and intervene and look at the folks that, and, and say, how are you doing? And here's what you can expect. You can expect not to sleep well tonight, maybe a couple of days. If it goes longer than that, that's a problem. Um, you can expect to be angry. Um, you can expect to eat more or eat less. For some of your habits to change, if that goes longer than a week, we know you are a good candidate for developing PTSD down the line. So it makes a difference by preventing that. From that shooting, because of the response we made, we had out of about 50 lobby agents, we had one person actually develop PTSD. And I think it should have been much higher than that, probably about 10 or 12. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you, if the SIR team wasn't around, what that would have been like. Right. Yeah, we probably would have had 10 or 12 people. And we might not have known about it for about a year. And that might have affected the members and their families. And um, so that's why it's important to get in and do an intervention right away. And it makes me wonder, what, you know, there's so many people that have that post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder, yeah. the PTSD, um, and it must be hard after something like that, so any tragedy, to function and go back to work. Absolutely. Well, especially go back to that same work area where that, the event happened. That's really difficult um, because now your fear response kicks in every time you go to work. Um, so that's why it's important to get in and talk about that and say, here's what's going to be normal for you for a little while. But if you don't get back to what's really normal for you within a week or two, we need to intervene and we need to get you some more help. All right. Anything else you'd like to mention? No, but thanks for having us. It's great to be here with you this week. Thanks for yeah. For thanks us so much. On. This Absolutely. is such an important topic. So yeah. let's just check and see if we have any comments. I know okay. District 141 and Dave Lehigh are already commenting as well. Um, so we have That's lots good. of comments. So you can join the conversation as well on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. We have Wendy Lee Green saying thanks for the show. What an awesome way to share this information. Didn't know this was even available. Checking in from Wisconsin, and let me see if I can find her. Wisconsin District 10, Local Lodge 66. So we thank you, Wendy Lee Green, and we hope that you pass on this information and let other members know about it as well. Um, that's where we hope, that we can educate our members, um, union members, even workers in general. Um, Tony Worth is saying hello, everyone. Thank you for the show. Um, we appreciate you tuning in. Kyle Winkle, uh, W24, thank you for watching Kyle um, as well. And who we have here, I'm watching it. Yes, District 142, Local Lodge 2339. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we always appreciate everyone commenting, liking, commenting, and sharing, especially when we have you know such great information that we know that can help um, other members as well. So if you have any questions, just write them right there in comments. So our next guest is IM District 142 Chairman James Samuel. So he is joining us right now to tell us a little bit more. And if you're just joining us, we're talking about CERT. It's the Critical Incidents um, Response Team. Did I get that right? Absolutely. All right. So that's what we're talking about. If you just happen to be joining us, whenever there's a tragedy or something has happened, there's the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, lots of us have been through tragedies, um, whether they're on the job or off, and we're trying to show you a little bit about a union benefit that is through our IAM transportation territory. Um, so first off, James, what has your experience been like with CERT? So uh, it started. Uh, ironically enough, out of some of the horrific tragedies we had with um, certain cities where we have members. And primarily for me, it was with Southwest. Uh, an inordinate amount of shootings at the airport, which involved sometimes directly targeting our members. Other times they were just uh, random shootings, such as in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we had a shooting in Oklahoma City. We've had shooting in LAX. That is incredible. These Obviously. are all within feet of our members. and. Uh, what really got my direct involvement was during the Fort Lauderdale shooting, I actually had people calling me, asking me questions in real time. 
and it got me to thinking and, and I started drawing on my veteran background. I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps and um, it led me to advocate and start asking questions about what are we doing, what are our airlines that we deal with, what are they doing to protect our members? Um, and out of that, I developed a program that was just a natural extension of what the CERT team does, which is trying to educate our members about things that are important to their safety on the job. What were some of the questions you would get when people would call you after something happened? So amazingly enough, uh, once you go and look at the training, it's called Run, Hide, and Fight. It's, it, it's very generic. You, if you Google Run, Hide, Fight, you'll find multiple forms of training online. But simple things like, uh, what is the national standard to not look threatening to a law enforcement officer? Wow. Most people don't know the answer to that. But the simple answer is put your hands in the air, mm -hmm. nothing in your hands. What I had people doing in the middle of that, so picture 10,000 people trying to evacuate Terminal 1 while shooting is actually going on. Somebody takes the time to call me to say, hey, they're telling us to put our hands up. I'm like, put your phone down and put your hands in the air. Call me when it's all over, but do this for me right now. So out of that, myself and a couple of the other general chairs on District 142, we made it a point to go sit down with all of the airlines we deal with. And in District 142, that's 12 different airlines, to find out what are you doing to protect our members? Are you at least training to a minimum level? Uh, the initial responsible, uh, responses were terrible, uh, absolutely terrible. That's what led me down the path to create our own program and to go start teaching it to our folks. Uh, we did that primarily starting with Southwest, but I got an invite from the CERT group to come up and teach that same program to them since they kind of developed at the same time. So that, that's how I kind of got involved with CERT. That is wonderful. Um, can you see over time how much it has helped? Yeah, so the, the unique thing about the training, uh, it, it's nothing um, more than um, organized common sense. The problem is most people, if you go back to, to at least people my age, when we were in grade school, we had tornado drills. We had fire drills. Mm -hmm. They drilled it into your head, know where the closest exit is. So, I remember bomb drills in kindergarten, going into the hallway and putting your head down. Crawling under our desk right, for the nuclear. Right. We, I mean, we had those when we were little. It doesn't matter. The, the, the thing with that training was, it was a threat. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a fire, a tornado, anything. This is the same thing, it's no different. The problem is we have these horrific tragedies occurring now right where our members are working. And that is something relatively new. So what goes through I mean I can imagine what I would go through, but just to help our audience understand, what is going through a person's mind when something just happens out of the blue and you're just at work trying to do your job? So for the most part they don't think. That's why, like I said, with my training, I took what the government has created in their run, hide, fight program, and I've made it more interactive. So, uh, and, and the, the people in the CERT class can attest, as well as all the members that I've showed it to, it forces you to think um, about your workplace proactively. So, when the time comes, if the time comes, God help us if it does, it is already there. It has been in your mind, and you can recall it instead of having to think in a high-stress situation. Most people don't think in high stress situations, they react. The, the thing with run, hide, fight is you have to think about what's going on to know what your best option is, whether it's to run or flee, whether it's to hide or shelter in place, or to literally fight for your life. So the, the, you know, the, the presentation itself is about an hour, gets people out of their seats, make people think. I also make people uh, diagram their workplaces from memory so they know where all the, the escape routes and the exits are. You know, some people will say, well, that's paranoia. It's not. It's preparedness. That's all it is. I hate to see that any of our members would, uh, would be harmed. So that, that's why, kind of why we d developed the training. Yeah, we need to try to save lives. It does right, save right. lives. Wow. Anything else you'd like to mention? No, again, uh, thank you to the IP and, and GBP, uh, Cito Pantoya, and all the transportation staff. They've been wonderful supporting all of this. So. We have a good union, good territory, so we're so proud of the transportation territory. Yes.
So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for having us. And we have people already making comments um, here. Um, quite a few new ones as well. You can comment, you can like, you can share, uh, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. YouTube, we have live chat. But Twitter, just hit the reply button. Facebook, we're looking at the comments now in real time. Um, so here, we have Alan, uh, is it Grande? Saying, hello, thank you for your pre presenting this. It is a great way to a faster response on the ground in real time. Um, is this a national program? I was a plumber for the New York City Transit Authority, TWU Local 100 Transit Union, New York City. Um, I was a September 11th first responder to the World Trade Center site, you know, in the aftermath of September 11th. So thank you so much, Al Alan Grande, for writing in. There are so many people watching that are either have been in interacting with this CERT team, uh, the Critical Incident Response Team, or have been through tragedies. There are also people that are watching, and we thank you for watching, that are first responders, like um, Alan Grande. Um, so we have these districts, District 141, District 142, um, all over, um, and we're getting good props from people all across the nation um, who have done this. Um, we have, who else do we have? Kelly Easy Street saying solidarity from TCU IM 6762. Uh, great work, Tia and Delane. Thank you, Kelly. We appreciate that as well. Um, we have uh, Juliana Helminski saying, great info, Jim, and thank you all for your assistance in organizing um, as well. So getting lots of props there. Um, and now um, we want to let you know that many companies and organizations have employee assistance programs, also known as EAP. Kathy Ferguson is here to explain how EAP was part of the foundation for the Critical Incidents Response Team, or CERT. So thank you for being here, Kathy. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about EAP and how it is sort of the foundation for this. Well, when you look at some organizations, as you mentioned, some have an EAP program and some don't. Uh, the IAM has been around at United Airlines uh, actually from the 70s, okay, a very active uh, part. Uh, we have both the corporate EAP there, okay, and they operate, you know, independently. Quite often we work with them in tandem, um, but overall our structure is that uh, we're with District 141 at United. And our director, Brian Hutchinson, was just on earlier. And he oversees the general program at United. Okay? I work closely with him. And the way we're structured, we have seven regional EAPs that are all trained across the country. So we've got uh, Los Angeles, okay. uh, San Francisco, Denver, Houston, Chicago. They're freezing today. <laughs> oh. Newark. <laughs> and then the greater Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area that I uh, represent uh, uh, here. So we have over 100 volunteer EAPs in the IAM team that have gotten training here through the IAM through the years, okay? So whenever we have an incident, you know, the world is, is changing right before our, our very eyes. So whenever we have a situation, we have trained individuals and CERT team, critical incident team, and EAP go hand in hand, okay? So I can give you a couple examples we've talked about earlier. We've yes, talked about the, CERT is in action. Yeah, the flood in um, Hurricane Harvey in Houston. So we activated our team, um, our Houston Regional, okay? She doesn't operate in individually. We brought in our Los Angeles um, Regional. Uh, myself was there, our Denver Regional was there. We also realized that uh, when somebody is working an incident like this, that they might need relief. So after two or three days, they assess the situation. We report to each other uh, every evening, find out what's going on. We assess the needs that are happening. We've got over 2,000 employees at United Airlines in Houston. So we had to figure out how many of them were in need. And it's an ongoing process. And when there's an incident, uh, it's quite chaotic initially in I the beginning. I can't imagine working and then dealing with a flood like that. It, 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 Houston was truly chaotic. Uh, uh, trust me, it was. So uh, even getting hotel rooms was extremely uh, difficult uh, initially. So those are some of the things that we do boots on the ground immediately. Okay, um, and Houston was a situation that was um, long-lasting and ongoing, where we had to go back in and, and find out a month in, two months in, three months in, you know, we had people that were still uh, in need. 
Yeah, people tend to forget. Like, it's not just that one week where it's the worst. Correct, correct, yeah. And then you've heard them talk about uh, certainly shootings. Um, the Pulse nightclub was a very interesting situation. So we talk, my role at United Airlines is I'm the chairperson for the EAP program, okay? So here's, you know, your phone starts ringing and there's a shooting. It's at a nightclub and you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with us? Okay, all right, trust me, your phones are ringing and then you find out there was a Southwest Airlines employee that was there and was injured. Okay, now it's personal, it's I am, one of ours, okay? Then we also identified that there was a United Airlines employee who lost his son, okay? So again, you had two different airlines going on. I didn't work for Southwest, I certainly worked for United, but guess what? We're all the same family, the I am family. So we're all there working together, okay? Then we had um, the Letterkenny, Army Depot. You stop and think about that, okay. All right, United Airlines chairperson on Army Depot. Okay, uh, never been involved in something like that. But again, we had IM members that were there. And the thing that I came away with, not initially, you know, when you reflect back, was the Grand Lodge was in, involved uh, initially and in certainly asking for uh, the critical incident team to go out there. Um, we lucked out that a Grand Lodge rep happened to be on the property when we got there. Oh my goodness, she was so instrumental in introducing us to people and, and showing us the ropes. Uh, being an Army Depot, we really didn't have access to the actual site or the actual employees unless they actually came into the union office. So that was another unique situation. So were you based there something. at the office? Yeah, and, yeah, okay. and uh, uh, Scott, hi Scott, you wrote in earlier. Um, Scott was new to the job, and uh, he came in, he's like, oh, thank you, you know, the, the army is here, the, you know, what do you call, the cavalry is here, excuse me. So uh, he was happy to have uh, EAP support there, and uh, then we did eventually get to work with several family members uh, uh, directly involved and um, again, trying to support them after the fact. But I came away from Letterkenny, again, watching the Grand Lodge rep that was there. Uh, these were federal uh, IAM employees that I had never had an involvement before working with uh, uh, United. I met some um, uh, district reps that were there that was, uh, uh, again, outside of my parameters with something like United Airlines. And it was beautiful to see everybody come together, uh, all just to help uh, the membership and to watch how they worked as a, as, a, as a team. So, you know, you talk about how you have EAP and working hand in hand with CERT. <laughs> how much of a difference does it make to have the have to, for the airlines to have this CERT team help? Well, certainly from our viewpoint, we, are, we see ourselves as a great asset to them. Uh, you know, there are changes going on in the world. There have been mergers, certainly, uh, with airlines and different um, cultures and philosophies in that. Uh, but like I said, the IM's been around at United since the 70s. We aren't going anywhere. Uh, we're here to stay. And we certainly think that we are an asset uh, to them and to the membership. Uh, I'm here locally in Washington from uh, Local Lodge 1759. Uh, we work to support our people here and anywhere else that they're needed. So, so this is a union benefit. We are here to help the members, it and is. this is available. Um, if there's anything, oh, I know what I want you to mention. What's that? The people who are watching that are just learning about this, if they want more information, about CERT, mm -hmm. who do they call? Uh, Sandy Gardner is our Grand Lodge uh, representative uh, here, Ooh. responsible. Before you do that, Kathy yes. does a wonderful job for our membership. We got yeah. that up on the screen. That is from IM Capital Air Lodge 1759. Yeah. Thank you very at much. The John H. Kennedy Hall. So we had to say that before Thank you, you, uh, you <laughs> go in. So who's our contact person uh, for more Sandy info? Gardner with the Grand Lodge. Uh, okay. She's been a great asset and uh, she's our, our leader in helping us when uh, a crazy incident happens in the world. And she that's would her phone guide number, us. right? Yes. 303-385-7287. 303-385-7287, Sandy mm -hmm. Gardner. So she can give you all the information you've ever wanted mm -hmm. about the critical incident response team. And I must say, we've gotten great training for EAP, which is our, our foundation. Uh, 
uh, through the years, I've gone through the program uh, myself. Uh, I then turned around and was teaching some of the programs down there. And uh, now we've got the critical incident training that has changed, and our programs are ever evolving. So we're happy to happy to be there, happy to help the membership, and it's my pleasure to be involved in the IMEAP programs. Well, we're so happy that you were able to stop by, and all of our guests were able to stop by. Um, and give us this, this really important information because it really helps to have somebody there when something happens that, that out of the blue that you just don't imagine. You know, Thank you for having us. No problem. So you, you sit tight for a minute okay. um, because we'd like to know what you think. Please let us know. What do you think about the critical incident response team? So comment now to activate your voice about how to help your fellow workers during an emergency situation. You can still comment even during the replay. And we'd like to thank everybody who has commented so far. We've put a few comments up on the screen so far, but we'd like to thank uh, Juliana Helminski um, has commented, Alan Grande. Ramon Garcia, Dave Lehive, Wendy Lee Green, John Linbo saying hello from Local Lodge 289, Scott Geyer has witnessed this firsthand, uh, James Powell, um, Kelly Easy Street. So thank you all um, for watching. Um, we have Mache, I hope I said that right. Um, thank you so much um, for watching and for um, sharing your comments. Um, before they leave, we're going to keep them here for a few minutes, but before we leave, we would like to update you on what's coming up on our calendar of events that we give you every week. Um, so grab a pen, grab a pencil, uh, take a look at these dates. We have registrations due for the following classes um, at the Wimpersinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland. Veteran Services class is due February 4th. Social Media for Organizers is February 11th, and EAP2 is February 11th as well. For more information, just check that website, wimpasinger.iamaw.org. We also have some Machina State Council meetings coming up. February 2nd and 3rd is the Iowa State Council of Machinists meeting in Des Moines. February 11th is the Georgia State Council in Atlanta. February 20th to the 23rd is the New Mexico Council of Machinists meeting in Santa Fe. Uh, so mark those. We have a women's conference coming up for IAM with the theme, Women Rising Unite the Fight. So we have people arriving April 2nd. April 3rd is registration, and I think the actual conference starts on the 4th, lasting through the 6th at Bally's Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we have a t-shirt design contest, so if you know an artist, Pass along that there is a cash prize if you can design the t-shirt for the IM Women's Conference. The deadline has been extended to February 1st, so you have a couple more days, right? Well, what's today? The 30th. Yeah, you have two more days. So get those, uh, those, those t-shirt designs in ASAP. Other special events, we have the Transportation Conference coming up April 8th in Las Vegas. And the Legislative Conference will be here in Washington, D.C. Uh, May 6th through the 8th. We'll, we'll have members coming from all over the country. And the communications department is sponsoring a communications conference. Um, that's where we got the term voice activation. That will be June 4th to the 6th at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas. So that's open to communicators. Um, definitely you, registration is open for that as well. For more information, you can visit our website, goiam.org. That's goiam.org. You can also sign up for our twice weekly email there um, at that website as well. So we hope you got all of that. We are so glad that you have joined us. That is it for this episode of Activate Live, but we want you to join us next Wednesday, February 6th, when Delane Adams will host, and you'll learn how Union Plus has helped furloughed workers. So I want to bring up our whole team, our whole EAP team from District 141 and 142, because we're so thankful that they came here and joined us today to give us the great information about the Critical Incident Response Team. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm even going to let the Instagram people in on this. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks for watching everybody on Instagram.